Thank you for coming. Uh, we're hosting Professor Mike Woodrick, who's the Assistant Professor of Political Science and Director of Undergraduate Studies at the Center of Global and International Studies at KU. Um, he received his PhD in Political Science from Bilkent University in Ankara, Turkey in 2011. His interests are Middle East politics, particularly Turkish, Kurdish, and Iranian, parties and party systems, electoral behavior, religion and politics, women and politics in Turkey, and nationalism. His publications have appeared in the Journal of Democracy, Political Research Quarterly, International Journal of Middle East Studies, the Middle East Journal, and Turkish Studies, among others. His book, National Elections in Turkey, People, Politics, and the Party System, was published in July 2015 with Syracuse University Press. Thank you for being here. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Christina. So thanks for uh, letting me give this talk. So the, the paper, this is an interesting paper. This, this will actually, this is based off of work that I did that will be in the Journal of Democracy in April, so it's it's a being a upcoming issue, and it's basically focusing on local elections in Turkey in May 2019. Local elections not may not found, sound very fascinating, but uh, the implications in terms of uh, particularly how the opposition party won uh, seems to be of interest. I think because you you may be able to think of other cases around the world where you have a populist leader who's in power, right? And the, and the question is, well, how do, you, how do you address these leaders in power? How do you uh, think about um, responding to them or um, overcoming advantages that they might have in their dominance? So <clears throat> what happened in Turkey is kind of interesting for this reason. So here's the story. So uh, on... March 31st, there was local, in 2019, there was lo local elections in Turkey. And as the, the local elections basically determined the mayors of all the cities in Turkey and the, the local provincial uh, parliament, the provincial level assemblies, uh, local governance. And as the results were coming in, uh, the, the number of the votes or the, the margin of difference between the, the government party's candidate and the opposition party's candidate started shortening awfully quickly, right? That the, the uh, opposition party candidate looked like he, you know, was r really coming on in the votes and that this, this might not go the way that the government had anticipated. So right in the middle of the counting the elections, they just stopped feeding information, right? It goes dead, right? The, the Anatolian agency... <coughs> press agency stops giving a uh, word of what's happening. But in the morning, they finally come online again and basically admit that the opposition candidate beat this guy who was the, you know, one of the founding members of Erdogan's party, kind of one of his buddies, the last prime minister of Turkey before they switched to a presidential system. He had been cultivated specifically to ensure that they would win in Istanbul, right? And when they had to, you know, show the results, and even after they did recount and went through the annulled votes to find if they could find any votes for the government candidate, <coughs> the opposition candidate still won by, I mean, it was close, right, but something like a little over 13,000 votes in Istanbul. So everything that the president tried to do to kind of go back over this and say, hey, this isn't, something's wrong here, right, they, they couldn't d drum up enough votes from the actual vote to tally or the annulled votes to get the, to get this guy a victory. So the, the president and the president's party basically put a petition to the high uh, election c council and said, we, you know, because of voting irregularities, we need to redo this election, which is really kind of ironic if you're the dominating government party that's kind of in control of everything and you're worried about voter fraud of people that are kind of appointed in your watch, right, to do it. And what was interesting is that in Istanbul, the people that count the fraud came from people that were counting not just the mayoral vote, but several other election results, right? And 
they were pretty sure that all the other results were perfect and you didn't need to change them, but something weird happened at this election. So they petitioned for an annulment of the election and under pressure, after days of pressure, the, uh, the high election council or the Supreme Election Council said, okay, we're gonna redo the, just only the mayoral election. And it's gonna take place on, this was March 31st, it's gonna, it's gonna take place on June 23rd. Yes, thanks, Aryo. So, <laughs> Aryo knows. So, he's from Istanbul. So, the, they, they plan ahead. They, they have to go through a campaign again, right? And in, in this very kind of awkward situation where everybody knows what the president wants. Uh, even days before the election, he gets the famous PKK Kurdish terrorist leader Ojalan to ma make an announcement not to vote for the opposition candidate. Right? Like, that's how desperate he was. I mean, but on June 23rd, not only did the government candidate lose, right, they lost by significantly more votes, right? So the, the opposition candidate ends up winning, getting 54% of the vote, more than, or around, yeah, well over 500,000 more votes uh, in Istanbul, right? And the, the, uh, the government guy that looks like your grandfather who's not happy with you ends up in this picture anyway ends up losing by uh, even more so interesting story okay opposition wins that's great we're just talking about Istanbul we're talking about it's one city in Turkey why is this a big deal right why why does a local election matter why why do these results matter at all. So uh, I think we have two questions going forward. I'm going to try to convince you that this does matter and that what happened here is actually kind of interesting. So, um, you know, our two questions, right, I'm going to try to convince you is why this matters, why it makes a difference and why, why it was a big loss even to Erdogan, why it was a big result uh, for Turkey, why it might be important to us. And then, okay, they won. How did they do it? Right. Part of the story is um, the, the opposition didn't only win in Istanbul. Istanbul was the most dramatic case. But actually, after the end of the, after the, end of the um, local mayoral elections, four out of the five largest cities were now controlled by the opposition party in Turkey. Four out of the five largest uh, uh, cities in Turkey were controlled by um, opposition mayors. And what's interesting in Turkey is outside of the office of president, there's only one other office that comes even close to getting you know, such a high number of votes for one particular person. And that's actually the mayors, right? So the mayor of Istanbul, as you saw, it's about something close to 10 million votes that are out there for a mayor in Istanbul to get multi-million votes for an individual person is actually somewhat unusual in the way that Turkey does election. So in a proportional representation system, no one candidate gets the votes to themselves, right? And so it used to be before the presidential system that the mayor of Istanbul got more individual votes than anybody else in Turkey. But now it's second only to the president. This was a, this is the uh, a graph that came from a fairly recent poll on approval ratings for politicians in Turkey. And so what you would expect, right, if we, uh, you know, uh, approval ratings for politicians in the American context across the country, you would expect to see national politicians being the ones that are, you know, way up there. But what's interesting on this list is three of the top six candidates are mayors for the, the, opposition, the main opposition party, the Republican People's Party, right? The, so here's Erdogan at top. This is the opposition mayor who won Istanbul. He's very, his approval ratings are very close to Erdogan's. Uh, they're not comp this isn't a poll that competes them against each other, but shows their general approval ratings. Next to him, this guy is actually the mayor of Ankara. His win was also important, right? So in Ankara and Istanbul, uh, first the the Islamist Welfare Party and then the Justice and Development Party controlled those mayoralties since 1994. So this was a big, this was a big turnover, right? And they're, they're seen generally as being fairly popular, right? And then this here is the, the uh, mayor of 
Izmir, right, the third largest city in Turkey. The rest of these are national politicians, nationally known politicians, leaders of various parties. So what's also interesting is that the leader, the national leader of the Republican People's Party or the CHP, the opposition party, is here. He actually has two of his mayors who have higher favorability ratings uh, than, than he does on this list. So it's kind of a big deal. In Turkey, uh, there's another reason why this is important, uh, especially since the 1980s, the, the cities have, like, by entrepreneurial, innovative uh, parties who wanted to have governing control, like the AKP and even the, started by the Welfare Party, they realized that if you, if you take control of the major cities and you, like, provide them a lot of goodies and stuff, that you can create a vote bank for yourself in national elections. And they had been using these major cities to get a huge cache of votes uh, for their party. So losing, losing control and discretion over these major cities to get, you know, kind of populist clientelistic support votes is actually kind of a big deal too. So from a lot of functional reasons, it's, this, this is kind of a, part, a big problem for Erdogan to have lost these cities. The other reason why losing Istanbul was such a big deal, right, and you may, he looks a lot younger in that picture, and he is, Erdogan made his name by being a mayor, being the mayor of, wait for it, Istanbul, right? So Istanbul was kind of his castle, right? And well, that was one of the reasons why he put the biggest name he could possibly put in to represent the government for the, for the, in the office of mayor in the local elections against Imam Olu, the opposition candidate, Ben Ali Yildirim was kind of the guy with the, he had been prime minister, right? That coming down to be the mayor. This was, he was not wanting to lose that at all. And he did, right? So, it, and this is not a system where it's just, he's a little bit of a populist and this is a democratic system. That's not what we're talking about either, right? His party, and Erdogan have been in, ch in charge. The party's been in charge since 2002. He's been in charge since 2003. So uh, he's had a long time in power. His tentacles have gotten all over the place. There's very few scholars that would say that Turkey is still a democracy at the, at the present, something more like what we would call a competitive authoritarian regime. We could, you know, a few people could sit around with me and debate, debate that question on the margins, but let's not say, we can't say this is a fully healthy functioning democracy. And he has definitely used all the levers of his power to make the opposition parties have a major disadvantage to him and his party and his leadership. So how did they win? How is this, how is this possible? You have this populist in power who's got all the levers of control. How did he lose his castle? All right, this is an important question. So at this point, I'd like to take a, just a little bit of a step back because I think it's helpful that the opposition party had a very specific campaign strategy and that campaign strategy was intentionally trying to address populism and the logic of populism as they saw it right and some of what they were doing seems counterintuitive you were probably wondering what the words radical love even appear you know what is that all about that sounds pretty fruity why is that even in the title but it's, it's coming, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you here in a second. So, so populism, you probably know some of this stuff, but just to kind of help, help us think through the logic of, of populism and how it works, you know, some people have called, populism isn't this very broad, descriptive, specific ideology. It is an ideology, but it's very, I don't know how to say his name exactly right, Cas uh, Mude, or how, however you would say uh, his name. He's a f famous scholar on populism uh, and political science, and he argues that this, uh, he calls it a thin-centered ideology, and what he means by that is that you can add it to the left, you can add it to the right, you can put it in the middle, but it's got certain traits about it that are consistent across all of those variants, and it has to do with the nature, the moral nature within which the political world is seen. So what populism tries to do is create this very essential extreme dichotomy between some kind of corrupt, evil, wicked elite versus the people themselves. 
the people are honorable, the people are virtuous, the people are moral, and the, uh, the establishment, the elite, the people that have, been, that have been controlling things are actually working against the interests of the people. This is one of the foundational elements of this, no matter where, where it takes place on the left or right or whatever. And, and therefore, in this thinking, the populist leader, the, the party, but especially usually embodied in a leader, that leader becomes the representation of the people. They are the people, they are the people's will, right? And what they, what they do reflects the true, what's good for the true people. And um, they also, uh, if you think about, and this gets very comparative political science-y, but like if, we, if you understand the way that democracy is constructed, right? The, it's const there's two facets of democracy as it's built as an institution that are pretty important. One is, one is the vertical elements of democracy or vertical accountability, obviously, and that's what we normally think about with democracy is that, that the leaders are supposed to be accountable to the people and that there should be some sort of outlet, some sort of way that the people have some account, that the, the leaders have some sort of accountability uh, to the people's wishes, right? That's the vertical accountability from the leaders to the people. But democracy doesn't really survive without horizontal accountability. And that is the, the sense of like this division of powers, right? The, the assumption that you don't have one ruler in there that just does whatever they decide to do because they were voted in, but you build in this balance of powers to ensure that no one person uh, takes over the whole system. And that's the way that you maintain democracy and have it continue. So populists usually, when they arise in a system, they, especially when they come to power, whether it's a perception, whether it's a faulty perception, or whether it's a real problem, they are feeding off somehow successfully this sense of illegitimacy of the status quo of the system before they come in. They feed off of that, whatever that is. And their primary argument is that the, that previous system was not responsive or responsible to the people. They weren't, they weren't listening to the real people. Whoever the real people are, the true people, they're only listening to the corrupt establishment elites. And that, and that if they get people to, you know, when the system isn't functioning correctly or there's misperceptions in society of the system, uh, populism starts to resonate with larger numbers of people in society, right? So when it comes to power, there's ultimately, you know, this, this argument that finally the people's voice is in power and we should, and we should uh, embolden, enable that person who is us, who is the people, to do what they want to do, right? They should have the ability to act freely because they represent the people and that's democracy, their actions, represent democratic actions against this previous establishment or status quo that didn't pay attention to what the people wanted, okay? That, that's the reason why populism usually pairs with polarization, right? Because this, this moral dichotomy that's built creates an environment that actually works to the benefit of the populist, especially once they become, come into power. The, the polarization is actually good for a popul populist leader. They want you, especially once they're in power, if they have the numbers, if they found a way to get into power, you know, they wanna, they definitely wanna create that polarization. They, they, I think they do in any case, but they're able to benefit. So the polarization is based often become, it's not divided into lots of fragmented pieces it becomes a polarization of us versus them and a moral dichotomy. The good guys versus the bad guys, good versus evil. And what happens, what, what happens in this context is really interesting. So when a populist takes power, they've said all of these crazy things, right? The opposition loses and they're afraid and probably rightfully so. It's not, their, their fears are mostly justified and yet, all of this plays into the populist's hand. Because what happens is, the opposition, whatever levers of power that they still have left, whatever, they're going to try to like get this guy out of power. 
And so they're constantly acting and finagling in order to remove the person from the seat that they're in. And usually, uh, usually not necessarily by elections, right? That they might even, if they have the opportunity to find some sort of legal loophole or something else, they're going to do that because this guy's spewing hate toward them. He's an, like to the opposition, he's an existential threat. But the populist uses this into, in his moral worldview in this way, right? So as soon as the opposition tries to like strike back or prevent him from doing his policy, the populist says, look, see, I told you, they don't care about your voice. They don't care about your will. They're not Democrats. You elected me. I'm the, I'm the popularly elected guy and I'm trying to do something for you, look what the opposition is doing, right? And if, and if the populist leader can catch them kind of, you know, trying to find a legal loophole or whatever, they, they play off of that to no end. And I, not to say, again, the opposition feels and is often rightfully justified in being afraid and concerned and wanting to remove the person from power, but the problem is that they're act the way that populism is built the moral ideology that's kind of built into populism exactly plays into those behaviors. It actually works, and in most cases, it works mostly into the populist hands, right? They may still lose, but their best fight is a fight on that level because they've already argued and convinced to people that the establishment, the status quo, is against them. So if the status quo, who's now the opposition, is fighting against him, they're fighting against the people, just like they always were, right? That's the way, that's the way it can be framed. So, and often, as the populace begins to do these behaviors, they do act, he does actions intentionally to, you know, to cur curtail the power of the opposition, and, you know, and the opposition's out saying, look what he did, look, this is anti-democratic, this is, you know, high, in talking about high politics and all the things that are going on at the, you know, horizontal balance of power level. And the populist and his supporter, the popu what the populist is uh, trying to convince his supporters of is that, look, they're against you, right? This is, this is democracy, what we have. What they have is trying to thwart democracy. And so if, I, so if they attack me, that gives me a justification to attack them back, and that still appears to those supporters as something democratic, right? In, the, in this schema, in this worldview, right? Not everybody buys into this, but the populist supporters, right, are able, this all fits into that moral schema. And so in the frustration with the leader, in the frustration with all the crazy things that the populist leader is doing, normally what happens, the opposition gets very angry, right? And again, they probably have reason to be angry, but they get very angry, they behave angry, right? They talk angry, and they often speak about the supporters, right? Who would support this idiot, right? They say, or what kind of, what kind of uneducated, right? Un unthoughtful people would support this kind, of, this kind of a leader, right? You know what the populace does? takes those sound bites and brings them right back to the people, right? You're going you're gonna to vote for this person over me? Look at how they talk about you. Look at, what the, look at the hate that they have for you. Look at the anger that they have. Can we trust these people? Right? So the populist is able to create this little moral kind of worldview and bubble that ends up insulating his supporters from what's going on on the other side. And they like that dichotomy, right? Sometimes they can, even in that context, sometimes the populace can lose, but that's ultimately their best game, right? Heighten the polarization, create this moral uh, worldview mentality, uh, and, and it works. So to give you a little background, just a little bit before this election, there was a, the national elections and presidential elections in 2018. So the, and the opposition party had been had been approaching Erdogan and the Justice and Development Party in different ways, definitely, up until uh, the local elections. So, for example, in 2018, their strategy at that point was, let's fight, let's fight a populist with another guy that talks exactly like a populist, right? Let's get a guy that, he's, you know, he, he talks a good game, 
He's good at sending insults, right? So he can talk about er Erdogan and make fun of him. And so um, they, the opposition party choose Muharrem Enje uh, as their candidate. He was a little bit of a rogue player even within their party, but they thought, well, he's got this kind of charisma, this ability to talk. And so he was getting, he was getting the pot stirred, right? And there, there were a lot, a lot of people were getting excited. So like right before that, right before that election, this is a photograph of a campaign rally in Istanbul. You can barely see where the people stop. I mean, there were, there were so many people there. It was crazy, right? There were a lot of people there. Uh, right before, after that, I can't remember. I think this was just slightly before. They had a big rally in Izmir, right? Another very famous opposition party city, kind of the most famous opposition party city in the modern, uh, during the, the more contemporary period. There were, here it says, you know, they were expecting two million, they got three, right? So that, like, there were lots and lots of people there. So you think, oh man, 2018, this is it. Fighting populism with populism, this is really gonna work. And, um, you know, it does remind me a little bit, one, th one thing about, there's, an, there's a danger with the crowds. You know what a populist does with these crowds? Look at these people that hate you. Look at how many of them are out there. Look at what they're going to do. Look at, listen to the way that they're talking. What's gonna happen to you if they get, if they win, right? They can actually take the big mass meetings and work them against the people. There's also, there's also a history in Turkey, kind of a classic history of like large meetings not meaning anything when the votes are cast. So you, you have, this is actually a photo that's on the, the cover of my, uh, the book that I wrote on elections in Turkey. It's a very interesting one because it was the, it was right before the very first free and fair elections in Turkey in 1950. And this is, this is Ismet Inonu, President Ismet Inonu, who was, who was the single part after Ataturk, he was the, the second president. He oversaw the single party regime through World War II and then took steps to, to liberalize and open Turkey up to democracy, uh, starting in, it, it was a bit of a process, but finally in the 1950 elections, it was gonna be free and fair procedurally. And this was days before the election, and this is Istanbul. And once again, in this picture, based on the population of Istanbul, it's like almost everybody's there in the picture. And of course, uh, you know, and, and Inonu famously walked away from this saying, you know, we've won, we've conquered Istanbul, we've taken the city, and they got 20% of the vote. <laughs> the other party got 80%, right? So can't always go by crowds and, and big meetings. He, he was kind of a famous national figure. Some people just probably came out to see him out of curiosity and the whole notion. Some people were probably there because they felt like they needed to be or had to be there. Uh, but some, I'm sure a lot of people came out and were just like, here's uh, Ismet Pasha, the famous general, like what's he gonna say? So large meetings don't necessarily make a d big difference. In the presidential election, Erdogan, wins quite easily over the opposition candidate that takes him on by polarization. So, and you know, this candidate was saying like, oh, ought to so he, fighting, po what I mean by fighting or populism with populism, he was going around saying, oh, Erdogan's a elitist, he lives in a big, you know, castle, presidential palace, you know, he drinks, he drinks fancy tea in, you know, in his palace and he's got a gold toilet and you know, all of those things that you normally level at elitists. And you know, he said it in clever ways and it was kind of funny, but it, it clearly didn't make a dent, right? Especially not in this system that had been dominated by Erdogan for so long. So in 2019, the leader of the opposition party, Kılıç Darolu, uh, finally convinced people in the party to kind of listen to this alternative idea. And there was a, a PR guy named Bosch Soy who had this campaign plan and he wrote a book that was literally called a campaign strategy book called The Book of Radical Love. And he, that's, exa he, that's exactly what he called it. So the, the Book of Radical Love. And 
what they did was they began to disseminate this book to various campaign, local election campaigns that, you know, for the party. And the party itself chose leaders who would compete in the elections that were willing to buy in to this approach. So they chose Imam Olu on purpose. Mansur Yavash in Ankara, again, agreed to this plan. Like all the, the, the guy in Adana, the guy in, uh, in Antalya, like all, all of the, the candidate in Bursa. Bursa, if you remember, I said the opposition won four out of the five cities, Bur the five largest cities. Bursa was the one city that went back to the AKP, but just barely. It was really close. That guy almost won that one too, and it would have been five for five of the biggest city. So <laughs> this is the book. This is literally what it looks like. So they, they actually made an English translation of the campaign manual too, but it, this is what it looked like on the outside. And then here it says, you know, it's basically saying love, like giving the command to love, you know, my brother and my sister love people or love. Uh, and part of that was also based on us. There was a campaign that had some of this, some of these ideas for the opposition party in the 1970s. So they kind of brought it back, dug it back up and then bought, created a whole campaign program around it. You know, and this was in the prologue. It's easy to win elections. The more important thing is to win hearts. The one who wins hearts wins the votes anyway, right? So I'm ser this is like totally like clipped out of it. Like it was really this flowery. I'm not kidding. The campaign manual, you've got to see it. Like it's, it's I, but uh, so it's like right at the beginning, it's like, okay, what is this radical love? What's this campaign strategy? What's our approach going to be? So they say the main difference between radical and normal love is that the former denotes giving your love not only to those who already love you, but also those who do not. What does that sound like? <laughs> it sounds a little bit like Sermon on the Mountish, or is it definitely, ser it's got this kind of, this, these Sufi elements of, you know, loving even your enemies or those who don't like you. And you get that if you read the whole but if anybody wants a copy, I'd be glad to give you the English copy. It's really interesting. You're like, is this a spiritual treatise or a campaign strategy? It reads, sometimes you're not always clear uh, what it's doing. Um, but it, it, had paid, it even had comics, right, in the campaign manual, right, to guide people on what to do. And it's, you know, no, no polar, no people from the polls in our in our party, in our camp, you have to be, you know, so it's trying to reduce polarization in, in ways that also makes sense to us. Um, but, the, you know, so it's got stuff there. This is what it says close up. Dividing into camps only benefits camp leaders. Don't get polarized. Any, div any idea that derives its power from its opposite needs an opponent. It therefore constantly provokes the opponent, trying to pull them into the arena for a fight. We only have two camps, our country and the world. We are devoted to the shared values of our country, blah, 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 love for nature, freedom, equality. We know no other camp, right? So it's, it's really pushing the, the campaign manual is guiding the people of the party to not take on the bitter polarization, the anger, the hate the, uh, of that, that basically Erdogan and his party had been baiting the opposition to do uh, throughout all of the previous elections. Um, so, you know, it says stuff like this. We don't see the member of our parties as angels and those of others as a devil. We display patience and compassion, even for people who hold grudges against us. Every person is wise. So again, not this condescending. It's, it's particularly trying to get them to think appropriately about addressing supporters from the, who might be actually supporters of the populist. How do you talk to them? How do you think about them? And it's giving them guidance uh, on, uh, on how to think about it, how lucky it is for us that a shepherd in the mountains has the same right to vote as a professor, right? So it's really like, don't be elitist, love everybody. In fact, the, you know, one of the s slogans uh, that the kind of developers of this, this campaign strategy uh, used was, you know, ignore the leader, love his supporters. Don't talk about Erdogan. Don't get trapped into talking about Erdogan. Focus on the supporters and what they need. Um, 
Hatred cannot be overcome by hatred. If you focus on Erdogan, you're going to get into those kind of negative, acrimonious battles. Avoid high politics. Don't talk about that. Talk about what people need. So again, here's a little comic here, and the guy's like, oh, I need a glass of water. And, she, and she, instead, she's like, you voted for the guy the last time, and the dollar went up. You know, So she's just focused on kind of the abstract issues where he needs something right away. He needs something tangible. And so the campaign strategy was talk to people about the things that they care about, the, their everyday needs and concerns, uh, and not you know, not about these kind of more abstract, high political issues, because that's not where most voters are living life. The, one of the interesting things about this, when we did the study, we found like in all the campaign speeches, uh, Imam, Imam Olu made in public, the opposition leader who won, that he made in public, he only mentioned Erdogan like twice in all of his speeches from like May, May 15th to June 23rd. Right? And when he did, he used the word scion before it, which means like, you know, it's a, it's a term of respect before you talk about somebody. It's a, it's a respectful term. And he was ba in one of the cases where he referred, referred to him, he was saying, we, you know, we should work together, right? Like, even if we win, we still want to, you know, find ways that shared values that are good for all the people that we can employ. So he was, he was definitely trying to stay away from baiting the leader into a debate, right? And he even, he didn't talk about the candidate that was running for Istanbul, hardly in his Twitter feeds. Uh, he really, really, really reduced that. That was part of the strategy. And to focus on uh, high politics, he was also, rather than focus on high politics, it was everyday politics. And the argument was, you can't, you can't do that through meetings. You have to go and talk to people. So they very aggressively in all of these cities, instead of having big, large, massive meetings where the, you know, where their opponents could take pictures of it and get people scared, they actually went into neighborhoods of, con you know, where con conservative people lived, which often many of those conservative people might have been voting for Erdogan, and just went to talk to them about what they cared about, and asked them questions, and listened to them, and went around. And uh, there, a lot of those individual videos uh, went online and went viral, and people were paying attention to those. But they, they very intentionally avoided big meetings, and a lot of what they were having was conversations. Um, and this, this turned out to be uh, very successful. And that their promise of everyday governance, of clean, transparent governance, of open, open live video feeds of their meetings and, and the decisions that they made and transparent budgets uh, resonated with people. There was also a sense too, like I think that's definitely how he won the first time. He also got a, he got a boost in the injustice of what took place I think in the second time too, honestly he did, right? Because Turkish people, you know, that was one of the moments, especially it was interesting as the campaign went on, Erdogan didn't know what to do with him. He couldn't go right after him because the other guy was so carefully staying away from that that it, it got a little embarrassing if he was too critical of the other guy. So it actually forced Erdogan to, to, to kind of step back from some of his harshest criticism or his, his ability to get into a debate uh, with, with uh, Imam Olu. And, and in the end, it worked. But the, you know, the other thing, uh, the you know, the final things I would point out from this, it did work. It's an interesting strategy. I think it's interesting because it's, it's very, on a philosophical, theoretical level, is intentionally, was intentionally constructed to take on populism and populism's logic, and it worked. Uh, but it's a very hard approach. <laughs> it's a very hard approach for any, like, especially thinking about it in other contexts, right? Because it's, it's very hard for people who are really angry and who have been stepped on and aggravated by a populist leader to be like, I'm just going to ignore you and talk to people. I'm going to talk to your supporters and feel good about that. I'm, I'm going to talk about everyday issues that we all share. Rather than when you've been trampled on, when you've been stepped on, you want to take on your own, the, those issues that have been trampled on, right? Where the, the, the populist uh, 
then uses to keep the poles and the, the, the borders drawn between groups. So it, in these sorts of cases, one of the challenges, and th this was one of the challenges that Kalich Darulu, even in this successful campaign, not everybody in the opposition party bought into this strategy. And there were some, they, they, they begrudgingly went along with it, but I know even from the, the work that my co-author did with interviews and things like that, that there were, there were some people that were trying to subvert it a little bit because they were so angry, they thought they needed a fiery person and, and not, some, not this like kindness stuff that, and they needed, they needed somebody that showed their strength that was equal to Erdogan and not, and not somebody who was just nice and listening to people. Um, and so it's hard to get everybody on board. It's one thing to win an election, right? Now he's got to govern. And he, you know, there's been all kinds of, he's actually done pretty well so far. He's, you know, maybe some small hiccups and things like that. But for the most part, he stayed, he's, he's faced a barrage of fiery darts <laughs> since he's been the, the uh, mayor of Istanbul uh, and, and mostly stood up to them pretty well. But he's constantly dealing with issues. There's all kinds of sub subversion at the municipal level. Er Erdogan supporters, pro-Erdogan guys are trying to make things very difficult for him to, um, to govern the city. And the other thing about the approach, like it's an approach. It's not like a platform. It's not something specific. It's just a way of doing politics. So it's not like you couldn't, find, you couldn't form your party around this idea, right? So it's not that kind of a thing. The other, the other issue with it, of course, is that to the extent that it works, it becomes less necessary, right? And you have to back away from it over time. Like once you reduce the polar, polarization, it's not a very successful, you know, campaign approach. And the other interesting thing is that, you know, these, these kinds of uh, approaches can also create new problems. Uh, and some people have, have, you know, people who know the history of Istanbul, uh, would, you know, we know how Erdogan is now. This is a picture of Erdogan shaking hands with Imam Olu. We know how Erdogan is now, but when he was mayor of Istanbul and his, his, fir his first campaign and his first years as a politician, he actually spoke in a way that demonstrated a lot of the radical love ideas. He was a very inclusive, open politician, said that, okay, I, I'm religious conservative, or I come from a more, but I'm, I'm a guy for everybody, and I'm not, and he would talk to people, and he was like down on this, you know, the street talking to everybody, and a m much more of that kind of inclusive, open to everybody sort of population, uh, you know, politician. We see how he is now, right? There, there isn't, there isn't any rule that says, right, if you do this strategy and you behave this way at one point, if you have the opportunity, you know, who's, like the mirror image, you know, the mirror connection, you know, Erdogan was kind of a bridge builder, a social bridge builder in Istanbul in the 1990s. Could Imam Olu fall into the same trap, right? Some people wonder, okay, well, what's, pot in the, you know, what, what's possible there? So, all right. I'm going to stop there. Questions? <laughs>